Hey everyone, it's Nick Desonier again coming to you from Mozilla's headquarters here in Mountain View, California. And today I want to talk a little bit about WebRTC and describe it as kind of a three or four layer protocol cake. So I think WebRTC is really, really neat, in particular data channels. Um, one of the things that's really cool that makes me really excited about WebRTC data channels is their ability when you when you have a RTC peer connection, you can construct multiple data channels that are multiplexed on that peer connection. And what's really cool is for each data channel you create, you can say whether or not you want it to be sent reliably, such as by controlling uh, retransmission times, uh, the number of times something's retransmitted, or a timer for how, how, how long uh, retransmission should occur, uh, and whether or not you want packets to be ordered or not. Um, and you can create multiple data channels with these different properties. And what's cool about that is um, what kind of enables this behavior is this really cool networking protocol that's built on top of called SCTP. So TCP has a lot of very sh has very strong guarantees around data being ordered uh, and reliability of transmission and a couple other things like congestion control and all these other things. Uh, but UDP on the other end of the spectrum kind of has none of these guarantees. So what's neat is this protocol SCTP is kind of somewhere in the middle and it's configurable. So if you want it to have uh, retransmission in ordering, you can set both of those. If you want it to have one but not the other, you can do that uh, depending on your use case. Or if you want none of those things, you can have that as well. Now, one of the problems with SCTP, there's kind of two big problems. The first is that uh, usually when you construct a UDP uh, datagram or a stream socket using TCP, uh, your operating system kernel has knowledge of uh, kind of that stack, right? You don't end up implementing all the TCP logic yourself. Instead, your operating system kernel knows how to do that. Uh, and the same is true with SCTP. And the only mainstream operating system that has support for SCTP at the kernel level right now is Linux. Um, it is possible to construct SCTP sockets on OS X and Windows. You would just need like a client side uh, library to handle this for you, which it's building up these packets out of raw sockets. Um, the second big issue with SCTP is there's a lot of really old routers in people's homes uh, that do network address translation and kind of act like firewalls. And they essentially assume that all traffic is gonna be either UDP or TCP. And so when they see a packet uh, that's UDP, they kind of just, they tend to drop it on the floor and not forward along that packet, uh, which is a big issue. So we'd like to be able to tunnel SCTP over an existing protocol like UDP, which is eventually what we do, but SCTP is still like the highest layer of the cake. Um, now immediately underneath that, we have DTLS. And so with these packets that we send to people, it would be great to have in them be encrypted by default. Um, the problem is the the, the most well-used encryption protocol is, is TLS, um, assumes it's it's being sent over, over a reliable transport like TCP, and so it's slightly incompatible with UDP because you don't have this any guarantees of, de or, of delivery or order. So DTLS is a newer spec, it's very similar to the TLS spec itself, but um, basically it's more explicit about the sequence numbers of packets and a couple other things as well to try and prevent replay attacks, but gives us nice um, encrypted uh, datagrams that we can use. So that's the middle layer of the cake. And finally, the bottom layer of the cake goes back to an issue that I described earlier about network address translation. Uh, and I'll expand upon that in, a, in another video uh, that I'll link to, but there's numerous issues using the network address translation not so much if you're a client and you want to make a request to a server and get a response back, but if you want to act as a server on your own. So for instance, if you ever try to run a server from your, uh, behind your, your, your router at home, uh, this is a, a common issue. So there's this protocol called ICE, I think it's Interactive Connectivity Establishment, um, that kind of blends together a couple other protocols um, for trying to establish bi-directional communication uh, over UDP. It could also support TCP as well, but uh, in our, our WebRTC stack, it's over UDP. So um, the, the cake at the bottom layer is uh, everything's being sent over UDP, right? We're tunneling through UDP because 
uh, firewalls don't tend to drop UDP packets, or sometimes they do. Um, on top of that, we have ICE for establishing a connection between two peers. On top of that, we have DTLS to give us encryption. And then finally, on top of that, we have SCTP for giving us fine grain control over order and reliability. So that's why um, WebRTC data channels are really cool and really, really powerful. In particular, before we had data channels, we didn't really have a method of unreliable sends, uh, which is something that's really important, at least for the notion of multiplayer gaming. So things like the Tribes 2 networking model describe a way for you to kind of mix reliable and unreliable sends for um, having like uh, perfectly synchronized game state and other parts of the game state that aren't as important to be delivered. So finally, with WebRTC data channels, uh, we finally have this method of unreliable sends in the browser, which is really important for multiplayer gaming. Thanks for watching, and to learn more about WebRTC and data channels in particular, check out Mozilla Developer Network for excellent documentation.